We are at lecture 11 um, this week. I don't. We didn't. I didn't mention this before we started, but we'll probably meet all four days, and then the test is on Friday, so technically all five days this week. Um, we're going to do section 6.3 today. Hopefully, it will fit in with kind of the line of thought of looking at um, individual pieces, skinny little rectangles. Um, whatever those pieces happen to happen to represent and then describe one of those slices solid disk washer today we're going to look at the length of a curve or um, how can we use integral calculus to help us find the length of a curve and then another application another couple of applications in 6.4 um, tomorrow probably in the following day review on Thursday and take a test, our first test in here on Friday. So let's go into this application from Chapter 6, Section 3, the length of a curve or arc length. So we have, and let's try to develop this. This is one of the easier developments, I think. Let's say we have a curve in the plane, and right now I want the curve to be a, let's start off with it being a one-to-one -one function, so uh, no repetition of x values or y values. And that will matter as we go through this, but let's say we have a curve and we know the function that describes this set of points. What we would really like to do is take this thing that's curved and stretch it out straight, put a ruler to it, and see the length of it. Okay, That probably would not be all that accurate if we put a ruler to it. We're going to have some error in measurement. What we could do to approximate it is we could take the line segment that goes from here to here and say that kind of the length of the curve, but we know the length of the curve is actually different from that. So that one line segment is not going to do the job very well. Just like one rectangle under the curve is not going to do the job very well, or one trapezoid or whatever the case may be. So we take this curve, and instead of having one of these, let's go from here to here. And then once again from here to here. Do you think that'd be a better approximation? Probably get closer to the actual length of the curve if instead of just doing one big old line segment that we somehow subdivide it and we can do a whole lot better and thus the reason for it being in this section if we have this curve and instead of having one line segment we have many I don't know what many is, and you're probably not going to be able to see the difference here because of the width of the instrument that I'm using to draw it, but all of these little line segments, and if we could have a hundred of them or a thousand of them or 600 trillion of them, isn't it true that this thing, although it's a curve, clearly a curve, it's not very curved from here to here, right? In fact, you can, I've heard a circle, um, which is obviously not a straight line in any way, is the union of an infinite number of tiny little line segments. Well, you know if you take a triangle and quadrilateral and pentagon and hexagon and so on, eventually you take this thing that was not very circular in shape and you make it more circular in shape. That's the same rationale here. Take a line segment from this point to this point it doesn't match the curve exactly, but it's pretty darn close because the distance is small. So let's go back up here to this diagram. Let's suppose we wanted the length of this, this one red line segment, which is rough, but approximately the length of the curve from starting point to ending point. So in going from here to here, that's how much we've changed in terms of x in going from point A to point B. 
So that would be some increment of x. In going from this point to this point, we've changed this much in terms of y. So the hypotenuse, which is what we really want, would be the square root of delta x squared plus delta y squared. Is everybody in agreement with that? And if that looks reasonable to you, just Pythagorean theorem, then that's basically all you need to get you started on this particular line of reasoning. Would it change much if we moved over here to this diagram? Wouldn't this still be a delta x, some increment of x? This would still be some increment of y. That would approximate this line segment. We've got another line segment here. That's delta x, and that's delta y. And then what would we want to do with these? We'd want to add them together, right? Well, if we had an infinite number of these representations, I'm trying to avoid using the word hypotenuses because I don't really know if that's a word to begin with. Uh, so if we had an infinite number of these red line segments, each of which is the hypotenuse of the right triangle, how did that go for avoiding it? What could we use to add an infinite number of these together? What have we used to this point? Integral. Integral, right? So this hypotenuse, this one, this one, this one, and so on. We can have an infinite number of these hypotenuses, and we want to add them together, okay? So we're going to be able to do that. We want the sum of an infinite number of these. So a sum of an infinite number of these says we're going to be able to do that. Now that's very basic, kind of almost a, a crude um, way of denoting what it is we're going to be adding together. But each one of these is a hypotenuse. We want to add them all together. And if we have an infinite number of them, then we should get the exact length of the curve from point A to point B. Now typically when we do an integrand, delta x's become what? dx's and delta y's then in like manner would be dy's. So we're going to have to do some adjustment here of this basic premise. First of all, we don't have a dx or a dy or a dt, so we're going to, have to somehow get that involved in the integrand outside of the integrand. So we're going to add together an infinite number of pieces. Each piece in this case is an individual hypotenuse. So let's start with this. Let's finish with that. Um, let's multiply by delta x and divide by delta x. Is that legal? Mm -hmm. Okay, which kind of seems odd. So let's leave this delta x alone. That's going to become our dx eventually. This 1 over delta x, I'm going to make that the square root of 1 over delta x squared. Is that the same thing? Any idea where I'm doing that? Shaking your head like, I don't know, you do all kinds of stupid stuff in here. <laughs> We got a square root here and a square root here. Is it okay to multiply the square roots? Yeah. yeah. Sure. That's the goal. 
So I've got, under this square root, 1 over delta x squared. So I'm going to put the square roots together. <coughs> so I'm going to have a delta x squared over a delta x squared. I'll go ahead and write it this time, but it's pretty clear what that's going to be. I'm going to have a delta y squared over a delta x squared. And then outside of the radical, I'm going to have this extra delta x, which is kind of what I wanted to get in there anyway. So a way of getting that there is to kind of compensate for it, luckily, we can put the two radical terms together. Delta x squared over itself. It might be Monday morning, but I think we can all agree that that's 1. What are we going to call delta y squared over delta x squared? dy over dx squared. Wouldn't that be delta y over delta x, the whole thing squared? Right? And this delta x we're going to call dx. So there's our first version of one that we can actually use that's going to approximate arc length or the length of a plane curve. So this would be from our initial x value since we're integrating with respect to x to some later x value. Now one thing we do want to be true about the curve is we do want it to be a function in a sense that we're not going to have any repetition of hypotenuse going from one x value to another x value. So I'll, when we need that type of curve, which this one will suffice for um, a function, when we don't have a function, I'll make a diagram of that, show you why this is confounded by that, it won't work, and we'll have to kind of switch horses to another version. But regardless of the one that we use, we can kind of always start with this and develop the one that we think is going to be needed based on what the curve itself looks like. If it's a function, this is the one that we want. Why don't we go ahead and develop all three of them, and then we'll use the one that's appropriate for the problem that we're confronted with. So there's our first one, length of a plane curve or arc length. So we'll start with that. Why would we need something different? So let's say we have a curve that does something like this. Well, if we go from here to here, and then we're going to backtrack, let's say, from here to here, and then go from here to here, the problem is that as we go from this x value to this x value, then we have to backtrack and come back to this x value, and we've got some repetition going on. So we're not going to capture each hypotenuse the way we want to so that we can add them together. They're, they're overlapping. So what we would want to do, instead of going in terms of x, let's reorient and go in terms of y. So do I have to do any of that doubling back or backtracking if I go from here to here in terms of y? and then pick up where I left off there and go from here to here. That looks pretty good, looks better to me. And then go from this last point over to here. Did we do any doubling back or backtracking? We did none in terms of y. So with respect to x, we've got problems. With respect to y, we're flowing very nicely from here to here where this one ends, the next one starts, same thing here. So sometimes we want to be able to integrate with respect to y, because with respect to x is going to fail. So what can we do to this? Well, very similarly,
before we wanted a DX in the integrand. Now we want a DY in the integrand. What's your recommendation for adapting our basic little hypotenuse version so that we now get a DY in the integrand? Multiply by delta Y, divide by delta Y. We multiplied by delta x, divided by delta x in the other one. We can shorten the steps, but let's at least get this step in here. Delta y we're going to leave alone. 1 over delta y will rewrite it so that it's under a radical. So it's 1 over delta y squared. Now we can multiply the two square roots. Put a couple of steps together since we've already done this once. What are we going to have in the first position? dx over dy squared. This times this, delta y squared over itself is going to be 1, and this delta y is going to be a dy. We can do the same problem with respect to y. We're going to differentiate the function that we have, derivative of x. So if we have it x in terms of y, that's wonderful. Set up perfectly. Derive it with respect to y. Square it. Add 1 to it. Take the square root of it. Integrate with respect to y from some initial y value to some terminal y value. Again, that is because we need to do so Because trying to find the length of the curve and the fact that it's not a function, we're not going to be able to do it with respect to x. So there's our second version of this. Well, we've got one with respect to x and one with respect to y. How about the third? Kind of running out of letters. Sometimes we have x in terms of t and y in terms of t. So we could have 1 in terms of t or theta or whatever the parameter is. So that's what we're doing. We're adding an infinite number of these things together, these line segments, each of which comprises the hypotenuse of a right triangle. So we want a D something else other than X or Y. Let's say T. One over delta T. We can put that in another form. One over the square root of delta T squared. Now, if we multiply the two radicals together, what's going to be the first term under the radical? dx over dt squared. Next one? dy over dt squared and a dt. So if we, want to, if we have a function, we want to find the arc length or length of the curve in terms of x. We've got it. It's not a function. Um, it would help to reorient it with respect to y. We've got one of those. And if we've got a par two parametric equations, x in terms of t and y in terms of t, differentiate them separately, square them, add them together, put them under the radical, integrate from one of the t values to another t value. So there's our third arc length formula. They're basically all the same kind of just depends on what we're given in the problem and what the nature of that picture tells us to do. All right, let's do some examples. I don't think any of these are examples in your book. There are some good examples in your book. Um, but let's take a look at these, and then you have these that we're going to do plus those that are in your book. The first one I was going to do is actually the hardest one, so let's, uh, let me 
do this in a little different order. So there's our curve, kind of a strange function. And we want to go from the length of this curve from 1, 13 twelfths, to 2, 7 over 6. Now there's probably a big hint based on the A and the B that are given. It's probably going to be a whole lot easier to do this problem in terms of X because wouldn't the limits be a whole lot sweeter in terms of x than they are in terms of y? So I would like for this to be a function. It, in fact, is a function. So we can do this problem in terms of x or with respect to x. So there's our format. It's going to get us a solution terms of x, which this will. In fact, what happens on this problem? Um, you might say, well, when we're done, you might say, well, that's never going to happen on another problem. Actually, this happens on a lot of these problems. But what happens as we develop this problem, just as many other times, you're going to come up with something that is not integrable at all. You're going to have some ugly function under a radical. Substitution won't work. You need kind of change a variable, trig substitution, nothing's going to work. If that's the case, then just go to some other approximating technique, table of integrals, something. But this actually um, is not that uncommon what's going to happen in this problem. We do need dy over dx or y prime. What is that here? x squared over 4? I think I heard that. Is that right? Yeah. Is that the derivative of 1 12th x cubed, right? 3 times 1 12th x to 1 degree left, uh, less. So x squared over 4, derivative of 1 over x. 1 over x squared. Okay. So there's our derivative. So we want to square that derivative. integrate with respect to x from our initial x value 1 to our final x value 2. Everybody okay to that point? Anybody know what's going to happen? A key or a clue to it is that there's an x squared up here and there's another x squared down here. So the middle term is going to be kind of key to what happens. All right, we've got a binomial squared, so we need to square the first term. The middle term, and this is where kind of this process starts that it's going to allow this to work the way it does. The middle term ought to be twice their product, right? What is twice their product? One eighth. One eighth. Twice their product. Yeah. One half. One half, minus one half, right? So if you take twice the product of the first and last terms of the binomial, you're going to get minus a half, and the last term is that. So can we combine any terms under the radical? Well, we've got a 1, and we've got a minus a half. Very conveniently, 1 minus a half is plus a half. Now, I said very conveniently. Why does that make this problem workable or doable? This was already something squared, right? Is this something squared? 
shouldn't it be the same two things with a different sign in the middle? If this is x squared over 4 minus 1 over x squared squared, what should this be? x squared over 4 plus 1 over x squared, the quantity squared. So the fact that this was minus a half, it's being combined with 1, which now gives us the same number with a different sign. Instead of minus a half, now it's plus a half. So this thing under the radical, which you should always look for this because it happens more frequently than you think it would happen, is this mass that's now under the radical, is it a perfect square? It is. And what's the square root of that perfect square? Just what's under the What's the, in the parentheses, right? The square root of this quantity squared is that quantity. So we can integrate that. It was a pretty ugly integrand until we got rid of the square root. Now we're rid of the square root. Now it's integrating each piece. What's the integral of x squared over 4? Or 1 fourth x squared. It's going to kind of almost get, take us back to this original function. x cubed over 12. x cubed over 12. That ought to look familiar. And what's the integral of 1 over x squared? Negative 1 over x? Is that pretty darn close to the original function? Mm -hmm. It differs, but where does it differ? It's in, the sign. in the sign between these. And doesn't that make sense based on how we got to this point in the problem? We kind of change the sign of the middle term. Therefore, when we take the square root of this perfect square, anti-differentiate, we ought to be back. But we ought to have a sign change in between these two terms. So we integrated, now let's evaluate. At 2, what do we get? 8 twelfths minus 1 over 2. And at 1, 1 twelfth minus 1. So 8 twelfths minus 1 twelfth would be 7 twelfths. And we've got minus a half, and then we've got plus 1, which is plus a half. So our final answer would be what? 13 twelfths? And that would be the exact length of that curve from 1, 13 twelfths to 2, 7 over 6. So when you get to this point, when you've taken the first derivative and you've squared it and you combine things, check it to see if we have, in fact, a perfect square under the radical. That would really help the cause if that is the case. And that is the case with this problem. Not going to be the case with all problems. Questions on this one before we move to another one? Maybe we need a little musical interlude when we go to the next problem. Maybe not. Express settings? Yes, let's try that. Let's try it again. Did you hear that? I didn't hear it. Hmm, media player's not working. Disappointing. Today's the day, right? Sorry, took an awful lot just to do that. <laughs> Got to have some sound effects from time to time. That's it. 
What is that? 24. Best show on TV. <laughs> Okay, another example. Now that we're all fired up about 24, Jack Bauer. Okay, this one's this one's a little stubborn. And I, I had this written down as my first example, but I didn't want to scare you away with this one x to the two-thirds. So it really doesn't matter in this case if we go uh, in terms of x, we're going to go from a to 27. That's going to be pretty easy. That's usually not the issue anyway. The y values are okay too. 2 to 17. Let's see if we can, since we have y in terms of x, let's see if we can use the same format, 1 plus dy over dx squared, integrate everything with respect to x, and we're going to go then from 8 to 27. dy over dx. What's the derivative of 3x to the 2 thirds? Got agreement on that? Okay, and derivative of negative 10? I might as well do my part. That would be zero, right? I want to go ahead and feel like I'm doing my part here. All right, 1 plus first derivative squared. What's the first derivative squared? Square the 2, we're going to get 4. How about squaring x to the negative 1 third? Negative 2 thirds, right? Don't we have something raised to a power, itself raised to a power, you multiply the exponents. It's probably worth a few seconds to check to see if what's under the radical is in fact a perfect square. Not so lucky, right? This is not a perfect square under the radical. But it's not integrable the way it is. We could say let u equal the stuff that's under this square root symbol. We're not going to have du, right, in the integrand. So regular substitution is not going to work. I don't think we saw a trig substitution problem that was quite this awful in its original form. So what we could do is try to get it into another form well, we've got that's really the same thing as 4 over x to the 2 thirds. Where am I headed with this? Let me do a little musical interlude again <laughs> while we're thinking, kind of like the Jeopardy background music. Anybody? One's a fraction and one's not a fraction. Put them together, right? Get a common denominator, see what happens. Somehow I've got to change the form because the form it's in right now, it's, we can't integrate it. So the first term, if I'm going to give it the same denominator, is going to be x to the 2 thirds over x to the two-thirds. And if we put those together into a single fraction, x to the two-thirds plus four over x to the two-thirds. Anything gained by that little manipulation? Probably, or I wouldn't have done it, right? What is what's gained by that? Yeah, we've we've now that we've got a fraction, and we've got the square root of the fraction. We can take the square root of the top, which isn't able to be found at this moment. 
but we can take the square root of the bottom, which is able to be found. So since this is the first time we've encountered this, we want to write it. And there's no guarantee this is going to work. There's no guarantee that it's going to get us where we want to, but in fact it does on this problem. So it is just another technique that you can try. Now, this in the bottom is the square root of x to the two-thirds. The square root is raising something to the one-half, right? What's x to the two-thirds to the one-half? x to the one-third. x to the one-third. And that x to the one-third is in the denominator, so if I brought it up to the numerator, it'd be x to the negative one-third. Why is this now a doable problem? You now, you can now you can use use substitution. Exactly right. So let u equal this ugly thing that's under the radical, and that's going to work if we have du, or at least a correctable version of du, in the integrand. What is the derivative of this choice for u? Two thirds x to the negative one third. So didn't we absolutely have to have x to the negative one-third dx to do the problem this way? Right? Doesn't this have to be in the integrand? And this is going to be in the integrand because we're doing the problem with respect to x. So x to the negative one-third, it's there. Now it's a doable problem. dx is there. What do we lack in the integrand that we can correct for? We lack a two-thirds. So let's multiply by two-thirds and multiply by three halves. Three halves. Uh, I'm not going to write in the limits because those are limits in terms of x and we're changing the problem right now to a u problem. What is this square root? What's it now become? U to the one. Good. A lot easier, right? U to the one half. And how about all this other junk here at the end? D -D. That's all du. That's a much easier looking problem. Not an easier problem. It's the same problem. can't be easier than itself. But it's easier looking. Everybody okay with how we got from this integrand to this one? What's the integral of u to the one half? Two thirds u to the three halves. Two thirds u to the three halves. And this is a definite integral. I'm not going to change the limits of integration. I'll just take it back in terms of x and then bring back the eight and the twenty-seven. So we kind of look out here, three halves, that was the compensatory term out in front, and we created our own two-thirds when we integrated. So u to the three halves becomes x to the two-thirds plus four. To the three halves, is that right? And we want to evaluate that from 8 to 27. So at 8, we've got 8 to the 2 thirds plus 4. And at 27, 27 to the two-thirds plus four. What's eight to the two-thirds? You did that wrong. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, getting Jumping ahead, I saw these were going to be nice things to raise to the two-thirds. So we've got to raise this to the three-halves, right? Is that where I'm missing? And we've got to raise this to the three halves. Thank you. Is 
seven minus the eight. Oh, gosh. Do you want to take over? Because I'm going to struggle. How about this? That worked? Yeah. There we go. Nice. Anxious to put that 8 in there because I knew I could take it to the 2 thirds and the same with 27. So this should be first, upper limit of integration. If your instructor had any sense, he would have put that first. And this should be second. So what's 27 to the 2 thirds? be the cube root of 27, which is 3, squared, which is 9, plus the 4 is 13. That looks like a nice value. 13 to the 3 halves. Okay, 8 to the 2 thirds would be the cube root of 8, which is 2. 2 squared, which is 4, and 4 plus 4 is 8. I would say it would be time to pull out a calculator on this one, right? Because we've got the square root of 13. I don't think I need to go any further. We're going to take that and cube it. The square root of 8, we could probably deal with that, but then we'd turn around and have to cube it. So I would abandon this exact value and then approximate each of these. I don't know if I wrote this down or not. I did not write down the solution. I don't remember it either. Yeah, I was thinking 24. Of course it is. It's 24. Maybe that's why I chose this example. 24 point... 245. Point 24. Yeah. Golly. That's just, that's like the awesome. Yeah. we got to do that again. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I wish you could see what I'm seeing here, too. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Two, four, five, though, right? It kind of ruins it. You could just truncate it. Yeah, we could truncate it. That's what Jack always does, right? Somebody's in his way, he just truncates them. <laughs> Questions on that process? Will all problems work this way where you end up with something that's not integrable? You put the two fractions together? No, they won't. So at some point in time, that point in time in this problem would be right here. At some point in time, you have to abandon, I've tried everything I could d can do. I looked for the square root of a perfect square. That wasn't there. I put two fractions together, got a common denominator, took the square root of the numerator and denominator. If this didn't happen to kind of luck out, being th the big piece of du that we needed, we would want to abandon that process at this point in time on this problem. All right, let's get one in terms of t, and we will call it a day. Let's say we have parametric equations. I think this is one of the problems in your book, but it's not one of the examples in the section. How does this version look different? What's under the radical when we've got parametric equations in terms of t? We still want derivatives, right? It's either 1 plus dy over dx squared or 1 plus dx over dy squared. But in this case, we're differentiating with respect to t. Square plus dy over dt squared. Right. So it's each of the individual's derivatives. Squared, right? Added together underneath this radical. Why the radical? Where'd that come from? It comes from the fact that we're adding together a bunch of little hypotenuses. dx over dt is what? dt minus 1. Okay. dy over dt?
Maybe it doesn't have a derivative. I think it does. Well, the 4 comes along for the ride. Derivative of e to the t over 2 would be e to the t over 2 times 1 half. So 4 times 1 half would be 2. e to the t over 2. Does that work? So we want to take each of the derivatives in terms of t, square them. I don't know what's going to happen, but I like the fact that I'm squaring this second one that has this ugly exponent of t over 2. And when I square it, it's no longer t over 2 because now it's what? How do you take something to a power? To a power? Multiply the exponents. t over 2 t. times 2 is just t. So that's going to help the cause. So let's square everything. e to the t minus 1. It's a binomial squared. First term would be e to the t squared. What's that? E to the 2t. Middle term ought to be twice their product. And the last term is the last term squared. This is going to turn out pretty nice. If we square this next derivative, dy over dt squared, we get 4 e to the t. So tell me what's going to happen on this problem, based on where we are at this point. It's going to be a perfect square. It's going to be a perfect square under the radical. Wasn't this something squared, right, with the minus 2t as the middle term? Now when we add 4t to that, 4e to the t, what's this going to be? Plus 2. It's going to be plus 2e to the t which is, again, going to be a perfect square. The same thing we squared, which was this, right? Except it's going to have a different sign in the middle. So the minus 2e to the t and the plus 4e to the t As Nicole said, that's going to be a perfect square. That's going to be e to the t plus 1, the quantity squared. The square root of that perfect square so we get e to the t plus 1. We're going to integrate it. What's the integral of e to the t? Integrated with respect to t would just be e to the t. Integral of 1 with respect to t. We're out of time, so I'm just going to say, what would we do? We'd put in 3. If we had any smarts at all, unlike me on the last problem, we'd put in the upper limit of integration first. We'd from subtract from that what we get when we put in the lower limit of integration. Okay, I will see you tomorrow.